Hey guys, what's going on? Andy Baker of andybaker.com and owner of Kingwood Strength and Conditioning. And um, today what I wanted to talk about was uh, a subject that I'm pretty familiar with and most of you guys uh, know that if you've read uh, the Barbell Prescription and you're familiar with my work with seniors. Um, and that is the subject of Barbell Training for Seniors. Um, and what I wanted to specifically talk about was not so much you know, the, the exact sets and reps and exact programming and that sort of thing for seniors, but more so from maybe your perspective as the viewer, um, maybe you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, so obviously not quite considered a senior, but you probably have parents or grandparents that are, um, and you would like to get them under the barbell. Um, now, this is, uh, this is a challenge. A good portion of the clientele now that I train, a good, a good portion of my coaching practice now is specifically dedicated to seniors. So I have a lot of clients that are, you know, 65, 75, and even up to uh, 85 years old. My oldest client at the moment is 88 years old. I have several in their 80s, a bunch in their 70s, um, you know, and then lots of people in their 60s. So, you know, what, what constitutes a senior? Um, you know, there's not an exact age breakdown. So when we wrote the barbell prescription, we did it for, you know, trainees 40 plus. Um, obviously, there's a lot of difference between training somebody that's 45, 65, or 85. So you can't just lump everybody in the same group that's over 40. It's just that, you know, typically after about 40 years of age, you, you start to have to make a few remediations uh, here and there for, um, for programming purposes. So, um, you know, with a guy that's 40 or 45 and athletic, you don't have to change, you know, hardly anything except maybe a few sets and reps here or there. But obviously, with you know, the older that somebody gets, the more um, the more uh, tweaks and changes you might have to make to their programming to allow them to strength train effectively and productively. So, um, but what I want to talk about is, you know, how do you guys go about getting people that you care about, your mom and dad, your grandma or grandpa, or just, you know, a relative or a friend or anybody that you care about that you know could benefit from strength training, but is, you know, not there yet. It's a big step for somebody of that age demographic to go to a gym and it's it's not enough to just tell them hey you know you could really benefit from strength training so why don't you go join the, the local Y down the street or the Gold's Gym down the street and start a strength training program I can tell you that's never gonna happen um, you know the first thing to realize with 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 training this demographic or getting them into the gym you really have to know your audience and you really have to know who they are um, you know and kind of where they're at mindset wise to get them from you know the couch to the squat rack because that's a big step for most people so uh, you know what I would tell you is recognize first of all that someone this age is gonna be really really scared and really really skeptical about starting a barbell based strength training program for that matter they're, they're gonna be they're gonna be scared and skeptical maybe about starting any kind of fitness program whether it's aerobic based or you know yoga or whether it's strength training with machines or whatever bands um, and certainly anything that has to do with free weights, you've got to be realistic with the fact that it's very, very difficult to take an older person who's you know, worried about their health and concerned about their physical ability to get them you know, from the couch and then all of a sudden uh, you know, into a three day a week barbell based strength training program. That's a really, really big leap. Okay? That's, going from, that's going from like zero to 100 without with trying to skip everything in between. Um, and that's not how most people arrive at a barbell based strength training program. That's not how I arrived at it. It's probably not how a lot of you guys arrived at it. A lot of us had to go through a process of doing things that were less effective in order to kind of settle and buy into barbell based strength training as the most effective forms of exercise. There's definitely a few, and I know so many people watching this, um, you know, that are 60 plus or, or maybe the exception to the rule. But most of the time when we're talking about, you know, your mom and dad, your grandparents, uh, you're going to have to bridge the gap a little bit with, um, you know, a little bit of coaxing to get them, uh, to get them into the gym. So, you know, what I always tell people is uh, you have to be careful about your enthusiasm for this. So if you're, if you're new to barbell training and you've had great results and it's changed your life, uh, and, you know, when you're 35 years old or 45 years old, your enthusiasm is not necessarily going to be a productive way to get them into the gym. In fact, it could even be a turnoff. Sometimes people that are a little bit scared, a little bit skeptical, um, are a little bit turned off and scared away by somebody who's really, really enthusiastic about you know a training program or, or anything else in life for that matter, uh, because they've seen a lot of fads and crazes come and go, and probably coming from somebody who's you know 
half their age and is really, really enthusiastic about a training, a certain training program that they found online or in a book, it's going to sound a lot to them like a fad or a craze. They're not, they're not dealing with the same level of context that you might have to, to you know, recognize how uh, valuable and important this training might be. Um, and so you have to be careful on how you approach them um, and not to come off too overzealous because actually you can wind up turning them away. And it's, uh, I've seen that quite a bit. When you deal with these people, uh, you know, your friends and relatives that you're trying to get into the gym, you've really got to think long term. You can't just think about getting them uh, from where they're at today into, you know, the starting strength basic barbell program because that, that may be too big of a leap for them. So any type of action that they will take, any type of corrective action they will take in terms of their health and their physical fitness, you really need to encourage. And it might not be, um, it might not be your ideal situation for them. And so typically, you know, if somebody, if, if an older person, if you're having this conversation with them, it's because they brought it up. And any type of action that they might take, so maybe it's a, you know, a, a friend of theirs does a water aerobics class at the YMCA or does some kind of, you know, senior strength training thing at, at the Y using machines, or maybe it's a, a yoga class at the community center. You know, just dealing with my own local community here, this is how a lot of older people get introduced to formal exercise. It's with these really low key, really low intensity, almost social type activities to get them into a, a strength and fitness plan. And although that's not really our ideal situation, um, for this person, we know it would be better for them to get under a barbell and squat. You kind of have to let them go through this process of just taking that first baby step to, in the right direction. So it doesn't even really matter what it is. I mean, obviously you want to dissuade them from doing something silly or stupid. You don't want your 75 year old you know, grandmother to join a CrossFit gym necessarily or the running club or something like that. But they're probably not going to select those types of things anyways. They're typically going to go with a word of mouth referral from one of their other friends into a very low intensity activity that may or may not be all that effective. But at the, at the very beginning, whether it's effective or not is less important as that they're actually going to do something. Now, we have this concept that we know, it, that we know to be true called the novice effect, which is that basically if you take an untrained person, a sedentary person who's very weak, who's got a very low level of physical fitness and you start them on a training program of basically anything other than bed rest, I believe the way it's phrased in starting strength, um, that they're gonna they're going to get some sort of positive feedback from that. So whether it's you know the water aerobics class or maybe it's just walking three times a week with a friend, they're probably going to start to see some benefit to this, and that's going to get the ball rolling, and it will be much easier to transition them from you know what we sometimes call silly bullshit. You can transition them easier from silly bullshit into a more effective strength training program than you can from the couch to a strength training program, to a good strength training program. So it's okay to let them do that. And I, I've told people before that you, you really want to deliver the, the smallest amount of the, the minimum dose of complexity um, at the beginning, okay, to get them started. So maybe that's just teaching them how to squat and maybe it doesn't involve the use of a barbell, all right? So maybe it's just, the use of some body weight squats off of a box or something like that, just to get them going and not being afraid of the squat and starting to see, uh, you know, the benefits of doing regular squats with increased loading or increased depth or anything of that nature that's going to get them squatting. Um, I've always told people, you know, sometimes squats plus silly bullshit actually works pretty well. Um, so you can continue to let them do silly bullshit. You can have let them do their water aerobics class, which actually is not the worst thing in the world for somebody that's getting older. You can let them keep walking or even let them keep doing their little mach machine circuit class at the YMCA if they want to. But pair that maybe with just teaching them to squat one or two days a week and they're gonna see, they're gonna see a lot of benefit from that. And then as they start to see a, a benefit from just a little bit of exposure you're giving them to actual real productive strength training, they're gonna be more apt to kind of follow your lead into more and more advanced stuff. But it, it has to kind of be a progressive process. It's unfortunately most people aren't really good at going from zero to 100 all the way into the barbell program. So start to start to ease them into it over time, um, and don't dissuade them from from keeping up the habits of regular physical training, even if that physical training is is maybe not the best thing in the world for them. And over time, just like it happened with me, just like it probably happened with a lot of you guys, the more you're exposed to high quality barbell training the more you start to see kind of the futility of everything else. 
all right? And that's, that's true in any program. It happened with CrossFit. People come into CrossFit, they're doing 100 different exercises, but somewhere in there, they're squatting, front squatting, deadlifting, cleaning, pressing, benching, all that. And over time, what happens is that most people, if they're paying attention, start to recognize that, you know what? It's the squats and the deadlifts and the cleans and the presses that are really giving me about 80 or 90% of the benefit from this program. And the med ball throws and the rope climbing and the bear crawls and all the silly bullshit that goes along with a lot of CrossFit programs, that's just almost interfering with what I'm doing. So I'm gonna gravitate away from this CrossFit program and I'm just gonna take away from it the things that worked, which are the barbell exercises. And you'll see the same thing happen with your seniors. If you can get them doing a little bit of barbell work, they'll start to see, you know what, maybe the yoga stuff actually isn't really doing that much and I'm getting a lot more benefit from squatting with this guy. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll lean a little bit more on the squatting and you know, he's wanting to show me this exercise called a deadlift that he, he says is you know, just as good as a squat and might help my low back pain. And you know, the squats work so well, so maybe I'll, I'll let him teach me the, you know, the deadlift as well. And so typically these things happen kind of progressively. And so you just have to be patient, you have to think long-term and you have to kind of let this run its course, okay? The other thing that's really, really important with seniors, um, and this is kind of frustrating having you know, co-written a book that's uh, about strength training for seniors. It's very heavy on the, on the science end of it, thanks to my co-author, Dr. Jonathan Sullivan, not really so much to me on the science part of it. Um, but giving people that information, providing them with the science and, you know, kind of the, the biological evidence that this is what happens when you age, here's what happens when you strength train, and here's all the potential benefits and everything from a scientific perspective, it's not going to have any impact. Okay, so unfortunately, giving your mom or your dad the barbell prescription is not necessarily going to convince them to get off the couch. Now, in a few cases it might, but for the most part, um, they're gonna have to almost wait on that material. It's almost like they need to start the training first and then kind of read up on it, and it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense to it, and it'll just create even more buy-in to what they're already doing. Um, but a lot of people have this kind of you know, fantastical notion that they're just going to hand their mom and dad starting strength and they're going to read it and be just as excited as they were the first time they read it and they're going to immediately jump up and start a barbell program and usually that's not the way it works. The, the more context you have and the more background you have training, the more books like Starting Strength, Practical Programming, the Barbell Prescription, the more those types of books are going to have an impact on you because you have a, you have a frame of reference for those books in the material in there, the more it makes sense to you. But having never done that, it's a lot to absorb and it's not necessarily gonna be compelling enough. So I always tell people social proof is greater than the science, okay, to get people into action. The best thing that somebody can see, the best thing that a 75 year old guy can see to get him up off the couch and training is another 75 year old guy training. So again, as it's appropriate, as it's warranted, as they request it, you know, start kind of dripping in uh, little little bits of that social proof of other people their age, um, you know, doing the things that you would like them to do, and that will that will kind of challenge them in a little in a little way, maybe even shame them a little bit, which is not what we're trying to do. But it it it, it is powerful to see, you know, I'm afraid to do this, I don't want to do this, I feel like I'm going to get hurt, and then you see somebody that kind of looks the same the, the same as you look and is the same age as you. Well, they're doing it. Why you know why can't I do that? So it kind of lights a little bit of a fire under them and alleviates a little bit of that fear to see other people doing it. And if you can do it in person, it's even better because everything that happens on the internet, you know, kind of is like this mystical realm. Um, you know, even though it's real people in a real gym and that sort of thing, the, the more uh, in-person exposure they can have to people doing this, the better. So when I have a, a new client coming into the gym, you know, and I know that they're, you know, 60 plus, 70 plus, that sort of thing. When I have them coming into the gym for the first time, I really, really like to make sure that the way that I schedule them is right on the heels of a training session with another client that's about their same age. So that when they come in for their first appointment or for their initial consultation with me, that they're coming in and maybe they're getting to see another lady that's you know also 70, 75 years old doing a set of deadlifts or doing a set of squats. And so they walk in and you know it can be a little overwhelming, but at the same time, it's like, whoa, that's really cool. And she's doing that. And she's telling me that her back doesn't hurt and that you know, she doesn't have all these joint issues and she didn't fall apart and that, you know, if they have a little bit of time to talk, uh, you know, during that, during that session that, you know, it's actually really helped improve the quality of her life. And there is absolutely nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing I can say to this person. There's no book, there's no study, there's no anything I can give to that person 
that's as powerful as another person their age in action doing the work. So if there's any way at all, at all to expose somebody like that to somebody else doing good quality barbell work in person, and if not online, social proof is definitely the best way to get them there, or one of the best ways to get them there. As far as the training goes, back to the concept of kind of minimum effective dose, we apply that to several different, uh, you know, kind of features of the program. One is, you know, with the complexity of the program. So you obviously want to give somebody something simple to do. Um, and that really goes for whether they're young, old, whatever, any kind of novice. You don't want to overwhelm them with difficult material or too much stuff to do. So, you know, the starting strength program or some variant of that is really a good intro to do because it's only going to give them maybe three, four, five exercises to focus on. Um, and so they're not overwhelmed by a lot of, you know, a lot of technical things that they have to learn. So um, though there, there may be, you know, one or two of the exercises that they really, really struggle with. Uh, and so, you know, if I know that, if I know that they're maybe really likely to say struggle with the squat because they can't get the barbell uh, in a good position on their shoulders, I'm gonna hold off trying to teach them that. So, and I'll come back to that a little bit in a minute about picking the right exercises, but, at the beginning, you know, you really want to give them just the least amount of work to do possible. One or two days a week, um, you know, it could be up to three, but if somebody's really hesitant about getting them started, just one or two days a week. It doesn't seem like that much, but over, again, if you think long term, over a long period of time, it's going to add up. So even if they only average going up on, say, their squat, even if they only average one pound per week, that's still you're putting 40, 50 pounds on their squat in a year. Again, it doesn't seem like that much, but to somebody who's struggling just getting off the couch, um, you know, literally struggling to get off the couch or, or can't recover from a fall. If they, if they fall, they can't get themselves up. That's kind of the population we're talking about. Um, and just little doses of frequency and small doses of volume can have a big, big impact in their life. So we like to do the minimum effective dose because the, the reason being is you don't want to start overwhelming somebody right away. So all we need is a little bit more stress than they did last time. And that may just be as much as one or two sets. I usually never exceed like three working sets. Uh, with somebody if we're doing any kind of weighted exercise so um, and that's usually plenty to keep them progressing so um, but you can get by with even less than that you know at the beginning and though if you start with a, a very low dose of volume and frequency it's very easy to add small doses of volume and frequency over time if you start out too much and you get someone inflamed and sore um, and to where the training program is making them feel worse as opposed to better that's the number one deterrent uh, for somebody to continue a strength training program is pain, okay? And most pain that results from, you know, training in the gym is inflammatory in nature. It's very, very rare that people actually strain a muscle or pull a muscle or have any kind of, you know, any kind of real injury to connective tissue or anything like that in the gym. As long as they're, you know, they're progressing conservatively and they're being coached well, you shouldn't really have problems with injury per se. But if you overdo things, you will have problems with inflammation. And one thing about older people, they don't dissipate inflammation well. So when they get inflamed, their low back gets inflamed, their SI joint, their hips, their knees, their shoulders, anything, any area that's accumulating and developing an inflammatory response from the training, it's hard to get rid of that, okay? And you don't necessarily want to take some of these people that are on a lot of medication already and, you know, put them on a very high dosage of ibuprofen or that sort of thing. So if people are coming into the gym, even if they're getting stronger and they can feel themselves getting stronger, they're not going to like the programming if it's making them sore and feel beat up all the time. So we always go with a minimum effective dose, which is just do the least amount of work possible to get progress. And then you mitigate most of these kind of inflammatory type responses. And then, you know, if they start to stall out or whatever, you can add a little bit of work, add a little bit of volume to keep them going. And you can add it in small, you know, small bits and pieces at a time so you don't overwhelm them. The main thing that you want to do is keep them consistent and keep them coming. Uh, that's going to that's gonna be, you know, regardless of the type of program that they're doing, um, the main thing is consistency and hard work, and you're going to get them to be more consistent and work harder if they feel good about what they're doing and, they, and they're not scared of what they're doing and they're not worried about injury. But a lot of these people, the minute they feel anything coming on that they perceive as potential in, injury or damaging to their body, they're out. You want to keep pushing them and keep them progressing and make sure they get stronger, but you always got to keep in mind minimum effective dose. Don't overwhelm them. A little bit less is better than a little bit too much, okay? Um, so that's minimum effective dose. Okay, so last kind of concept is, 
is talking about focusing on what the client can do well and not trying and trying to avoid the the round peg in a square hole type scenario where you're focused on and this is this is a problem for a lot of us that you know really buy into the starting strength you know protocol is that we try to force people into the program instead of a program okay so the starting strength model really is the ideal it's kind of the best thing we've come up with so far for novices but not everybody's going to be able to do it exactly as it's written and you can't force the issue with a lot of the older people okay it's not a matter that they 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 can't do the program from a recovery standpoint they can't do the program from the standpoint of they literally cannot do some of the exercises so the main two that are going to give them problems are the overhead press and the squat okay as defined by starting strength so almost always when you work with somebody that comes in that's 65 you know or 60 plus or 65 75 um, you're going to have it's it's going to be almost impossible on day one to get them into a low bar squat. Um, I'd say it's, it's more rare than it is common to have somebody that's, you know, 65 plus come in and be able to low bar squat really good on the first day. Okay. There's almost always some remediation and the problem, a lot of it comes from the shoulders. Okay. There's a lot of people that they've developed arthritis in the shoulders, or if it's not arthritis, it's just kind of general stiffness and pain and lack of mobility in the shoulders. And there is no way you can get the bar down into the appropriate position without just killing their shoulders. And they may not be able to do it at all. Some people with some work and some prodding and some stretching and some practice can get there over time. Some people can't and you can't force the issue. So a lot of times you're going to have to pick a different squatting variation than the low bar back squat. A lot of them are obviously not going to be able to squat at all with any kind of weight. They simply don't have the strength. Very, very common for somebody to come in 60 plus years old that does not have the strength to even do one body weight squat to depth. Okay, so what do you do with somebody who cannot squat to depth with their own body weight for even one repetition? Okay, you obviously cannot put a barbell on their back. All right, so there's there's different ways to go about it, some of which I'll go over here in a second. But you 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 have to focus on the things that they do well. So you don't if they can't low bar squat. Don't force the issue on day one, and you, you may just have to give in to the fact that they're not ever going to be able to low bar squat, and that's fine. Because for a senior who's looking for general functional strength, any type of squatting is a million times better than, than no squatting. So you don't want to have you don't want to get too hung up on low bar versus high bar versus front squatting versus dumbbells. Any kind of squatting is infinitely better than no squatting at all. So um, don't force the issue with that sort of thing. The same limitations that are going to affect them on their squat in terms of being able to rack the bar appropriately are also going to affect them on their overhead press and they may it it's, may not be just a strength issue although most of them are not going to have a lot of overhead pressing strength um, you know even with a really light bar like a 15 pound you know aluminum bar um, it may not be a strength issue as, as much as it is a mobility issue and they, they really just cannot effectively train the press at least at first they just don't have the mobility to even get close to lo to lockout and so you don't want to have people that have really tight locked up shoulders trying to overhead press because they can actually wind up injuring themselves. So that might be something that you have to avoid at the beginning as well. So for what happens with a lot of these people is they, they start off at least as kind of bench press and deadlift specialists. Okay, so I have a lot of that in my gym and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Picture your grandma or your grandpa or your dad or whoever, you know, that's really ailing physically due to age. And you know, for a year, you have them come in one or two days a week and bench press and deadlift and do nothing else, just bench and deadlift. He's gonna see amazing, amazing progress and amazing results in terms of both functional strength, you know, development of muscle mass and just over, overall general well-being just from those two exercises. And it's, you don't have to stop with just those two, although that, those will become the core of your program. So a lot of people have them come in twice a week and we're gonna start both sessions. We're really gonna focus on what they can do well, which is bench press and deadlift. Most people can be taught to deadlift, okay? Even your oldest, most immobile clients can do some variation of a deadlift. It might mean you have to elevate the bar a little bit off, of the, off the ground, so you can either do like a low rack pull or you can elevate up on blocks if they don't have the mobility to get down to a barbell that's on the floor and you know get somewhat decent mechanics. So now we can go ahead and assume that we have uh, you know this hypothetical person started on a uh, on a kind of a modified remedial barbell program that's really got at its focus the deadlift and the bench press. And again, assuming that you're in a facility or at, at a home gym or something that's that's set up uh, the right way with really light barbells, light plates, and fractional plates. 
um, to allow for conservative loading, especially on the bench press. You're not going to be able to go up five to 10 pounds every workout, at least not at the beginning. Maybe at the beginning you can get some five pound jumps, but pretty quickly you're going to have to go down to, you know, one, two and three pound increments. So fractional plates, light barbells, light bumper plates, all that sort of thing is going to be uh, necessary for the training, uh, you know, of an older, of an older senior that's coming into the program, you know, really broken down and really weak and really not in good physical fitness. So now that we've got, uh, now that we've got the core of the program set up, that's going to be, you know, bench presses and deadlifts, that's going to start to build out the rest of the program. So where do we, where, what do we add on to that? Cause you know, we said we could make, you know, pretty good progress just benching and deadlifting. Um, but we can do more and we really should do more because there's other exercises that are obviously going to benefit them and help them to progress even faster. So what else are we going to tack on to that? Well, we do want to eventually get them squatting. And ideally we want to get them squatting with a barbell. Okay. At the beginning, as we said earlier, because of either strength issues or because of mobility issues with the shoulder, barbell squats may be out of the question for right now. So we got to come back to those. So what are we going to do now to help to build them to a point where they can get to a squat? Well, the deadlift is really going to help. The deadlift is going to strengthen the legs, the low back, um, the upper back, all that sort of thing to get them to the point where they can actually, uh, you know, it'll assist them being able to do a, a loaded back squat at some point, uh, even if they're not there yet. So you want to keep driving up the deadlift. That's going to help to build the squat. But at the same time, you want to do some form of squatting. All right. So whether it's a dumbbell squat, a body, a body weight squat, or even a, even a leg press, uh, you want to do some, something, some sort of squatting motion thrown in there. Although we're going to go ahead and prioritize the deadlift right now. So I will generally train the deadlift first in the workout while the training is fresh. And so they're able to put the most strength and the most energy into that lift. And then we'll do squatting maybe third in the workout. So I'll have them deadlift and then bench or bench and deadlift. It doesn't really matter, but I'll have those, them do that first. And then we're going to go to a squatting movement. Now, if a person comes in and they can't do any squats um, at all, and uh, you know they can't squat down to, to parallel with their own body weight and come back up, I'm going to start them with a box squat that's above parallel. So you guys have probably seen this method online a little bit. I've presented it a couple different places. But basically, I'm going to take a plyometric box that's maybe you know 18 inches in height, and I'm going to see if they can squat off of that. Most people can. But if they can't, I'm going to add some elevation to that. So I've got little one inch mats here cut into squares that are about the same size as the top of the box. And I'm going to stack those up and I'm going to find a spot where they can squat with their own body weight, usually for about 10 reps. Okay. And I'm going to put them on there and I'm going to have them do from whatever height they can manage 10 reps, two or three sets, usually on the first day, especially if we've already deadlifted two or three sets of about 10 above parallel. So that might be say 22 inches is where they start on day one. Day two, when they come in and we come back to that, I'm going to pull one of the mats off. Now they're going to go down to 21 inches. Day three, 20 inches. Day four, 19 inches. Down, 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 and down until they eventually get to a height somewhere usually around 12 or 14 inches that's right at parallel or slightly below. So it's a linear progression, but it's using depth rather than body weight. Okay, And this works for the same reason that anything else you know, that's programmed effectively work, it works is because we're making small adjustments in difficulty, workout to workout at a small enough rate that they can kind of absorb that and handle it. And so we're not taking them from, you know, an 18 inch box to a 12 inch box overnight. We're going to go down one inch at a time. Sometimes they may have to repeat a workout a couple of times before I take them down again. Um, but the deadlift at the, t at the same time is really helping to drive this. So they're, they're getting stronger by doing the squats, but at the same time as their deadlift goes up, that's really kind of driving their ability to get down a little bit lower, at least in my opinion, that's what that's what's happening. But either way, whatever the mechanism doesn't really matter. The system really works quite well. So we try to get them down to depth with just their own body weight. And then at that point, we can start introducing load. OK, you may or may not take them off the box. You can you can leave. You may want to leave them on the box or you may decide to pull the box away and get into them regular squats. If they really are struggling with depth and kind of finding that range, a lot of your older clients are not going to have, you know, real good kind of proprioceptive awareness and they're, they may struggle with mobility. Uh, they may have knee issues. Or, so depending on the circumstances, sometimes I prefer a box squat rather than a regular squat. So again, it just depends on the client. It doesn't really matter. The point is we want to get into that good, solid parallel or slightly below parallel squat with some load. A lot of times, the first time I introduce the load, I start off with just a pair of light dumbbells held at the shoulders. Um, so a little bit of load can work. It might be five or eight pound dumbbells, and I might progress them up in weight over the course of several workouts till they're at like maybe the 12 or 15 pound dumbbells. And then at that point, I'm going to go ahead and transition them to a bar. So I don't leave them on the 
with the dumbbell squats that long. It just seems to be a pretty good bridge between just doing body weight squats and going to the bar. But again, it, it also depends on the client and their ability to get the bar in the right spot on their back. So if they're really, really struggling still to get the, get the bar on their back, but they've kind of outgrown the body weight squat, then I'll, I'll definitely go ahead and just use some dumbbells to increase the difficulty a little bit. So it's kind of like a dumbbell front squat is, is what I would liken it to. So that's a, that's a, a, a decent way to introduce load. So, but as soon as they're ready for a bar, go ahead and get a bar on their back, a light bar, you know, 15 pounds, 25 pounds, something like that, but only introduce one thing at a time. And this is really important. Don't at the same time that you introduce the barbell also take away the box. Do one or the other first. So either take away the box and teach them to squat with just their body weight without the feel of the box because they're going to have gotten a little bit dependent on that box. Even if they're not totally relaxing and rocking back on it, just the feel of having that there creates a little dependency at the bottom. So pull the box away and then have them do some body weight squats and then maybe in a session or two you can introduce the barbell. But don't move them from a body weight box squat to a barbell squat with no box. I, I very rarely introduce two new variables at once, especially with an older population. So there's one thing at a time. And again, we're not in a hurry. They're squatting and they're getting stronger. They're progressing so we're happy. We're not in a hurry to get them into one type of squat or another. We'll get them there eventually, but just one thing at a time. Don't overwhelm them. So um, now once they can squat, now that can kind of become the priority of the program as it should be because the squat will kind of drive everything else. So once they can get into a good barbell uh, back squat or box squat, we're going to go ahead and move that to the front of the program. And now it's going to start to look a little bit more like our standard kind of novice training program where we're going to squat, we're going to press, and we're going to deadlift. Um, at this point, uh, you may go back to the press. If they've been training the bench press for a while, they've built up some strength, they've got their shoulders moving more regularly, go back to the press and, and kind of see how they respond um, and see how close to a decent press they can get. So you're just going to do a strict press. Um, so you don't have to get too, too complicated with the technique. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it needs to be good enough to where they're not pressing with the barbell way out in front of them. And if their shoulders are really locked up, they're gonna do a lot of the work with the barbell out here in front, and that's no good. It, it's not that effective of an exercise, and it can actually, there's some weird injuries that can occur to the traps when people are trying to press weight and the moment arm out in front is too long. So if they can't press with reasonably good mechanics, wait on it, maybe come back to it again in the future, continue to bench press. Um, what are the other exercises that we can add to this program uh, once we've got the squat, the bench, and the deadlift? I really like to add in some kind of pulling movement, all right? Um, for most of them, it's going to be a lat pull down, okay? I use a lot of the V grip, I use a lot of supine grip, and a little bit of kind of a wider double overhand grip. So I vary the grips a little bit, and I really, I really focus on this. I really focus on the top end of that motion to not only strengthen their upper back, and strengthen their arms, their forearms, their biceps, their grip. I don't just use it for a strengthener, but I really have them emphasize the stretch at the top. And I have found over time that the lat pull down machine, especially when you can really emphasize the stretch up there at the top, sometimes I'll have them hold it a little bit on the last rep and I'll kind of give them a little bit of upward pressure on there to really stretch them out. And most of them really like the feeling of that. And in a lot of cases over time, not overnight, it will improve their shoulder mobility. Um, as well as the strengthening that you're doing through the bench pressing and through the pull downs, I believe that, that that stretch, that vertical stretch overhead will really improve the shoulder mobility. Now, if they've got some, you know, kind of bone on bone type situation or, you know, really severe arthritis in their shoulders, those aren't things that can be stretched out. But just a lot of, you know, real general tightness, stiffness, pain, immobility in the shoulders, that kind of stuff can be worked out over time with training and practice. And I think the lat pull down, the weighted lat pull down goes, goes a long way towards helping that. So, Lat pull downs are almost always a staple in the program. Again, not just for stretching out the shoulders and kind of increasing mobility up top, but I, I just feel that the, the, those, those, those elbow flexor muscles, those forearms and the biceps are really, really important for older people. So I had a client years ago, and one of the reasons that she came in was because she fell, lived alone in her 80s, a little bit overweight, and uh, couldn't get up. And part of the reason that she couldn't get up we mostly tend to think of that as you know a lower body problem. The legs and the hips aren't strong enough to get our feet under, underneath us and stand us back up. It happens a lot with older people. They fall and they're like a turtle, they can't get back up. But also in a lot of cases, what she described to me, and I've heard this repeated from others as well, is they lack the arm strength, say in the shower, they fall in the shower, they lack the arm strength to actually grab a handhold and pull themselves up. They go to pull on it, nothing happens, or their grip slips 
Okay, so not having a strong grip, having weak forearms, weak biceps, just overall weak upper bodies, it's, it's not a good thing, okay? So you wanna train those muscles and they're not getting a lot of work, you know, just through the squat, the bench, and the deadlift. The grip obviously does, the upper back obviously does, but I just feel like those pulling motions are really important um, for an older person to include in their program, both from a strength standpoint and a mobility standpoint. So I almost always have some sort of lat pull down in the, in the, uh, uh, in the program, uh, as well as sometimes I'll mix in things like TRX rows. Um, I kind of like those. And then the other under, underrated exercise I feel like for older people is a standing barbell curl. So a lot of people kind of tend to think of a standing barbell curl, barbell curl as just a kind of a bicep isolation exercise, kind of a gym bro exercise. But really and truly, it's a little bit more compound than people think. If you've ever gone really, really heavy on, on, a, on a barbell curl and just watch your soreness pattern, you know that it's actually not just a bicep isolation exercise. You go really, really heavy um, on barbell curls. Now, obviously the biceps will get a little bit sore, the forearms, but the traps, the upper back, and even the abs a little bit can get sore. There's a lot of, there's a lot of work going on in a heavy barbell curl. Um, and I'm not saying you should really take people exceedingly heavy in a barbell curl that are older, but you know, sets of eight, it helps. Uh, we wanna do as much work as possible standing on two feet. We wanna do as little work as possible seated. Uh, and that's what a lot of these programs for older people tend to gravitate toward as seated work. But we wanna do as much work on two feet as we can in order to train that balance component. And we define balance as kind of the ability to, to center a, a system over the middle of your foot, the system being the lifter and the barbell that he's operating, kind of keeping that system in balance over the midfoot. And we use exercises that challenge that ability, the squat, the deadlift, and the press being the primary three, but if a, if a person can't press effectively, they're not doing any upper body movement on two feet. And so I started using the barbell curl uh, several years ago and I've, I've liked it more and more and more for my older people. They like the movement as well. It's a little bit, you know, a little bit more of a total upper body movement that people give it credit for. And so uh, I like it for that purpose. So I mix in those as well. So those are really the big ones. Obviously your squats, your deadlift, your bench, you overhead press when and if you can, some sort of pulling motion and then maybe like a standing barbell curl. And so you take this very basic, uh, this very basic novice approach and you apply it to this slightly remedial, um, you know, kind of uh, novice program for an older person and you, you operate it the same way you would for, for anybody else doing a, a novice linear progression. It's sets of five, it's micro loaded, it's fractional plates. You take them up as high as they can go. Um, you know, on the sets of five. And then from there, I would say, don't worry about it. There's lots of options. If you look in the barbell prescription, there's lots of options for kind of post novice training. But for right now, don't worry about any of that stuff. You know, if you're talking about your mom, your grandma, you know, your dad, somebody that you're wanting to get in the gym and get them going right now, don't worry about down the road, worry about getting them in the gym for that first time and getting that first session or two right. Because I can tell you from years and years of doing this in the personal training business, is that you either lose somebody or you hook somebody in the first couple of sessions. They're either gonna buy in or they're gonna get out based on their first impression you know, of the, of the program and what it's gonna do to them. So a lot of them are probably coming in expecting to fail. Um, you know, they're skeptical of you, they're skeptical of the program. Maybe they, maybe they love you and care about you and uh, they're gonna humor you by going to the gym with you one day and letting them show you how to squat and deadlift. You know, in the back of their mind, they like it to work, but they really don't expect that it will because they've probably given up on themselves to some degree. Uh, they kind of resigned to the fact that they're old and broken down and, you know, that weight training is for this, you know, younger crowd or whatever. Um, but the most important thing that they can tell themselves after that first workout or two is, I can do this. And if you mess that up, then you're gonna lose them. So you want them to walk out of the gym on the very first day or after the very first week of training, and that's the conversation they need to be having with themselves in their head, is I can do this. And so that's where it goes back to that minimum effective dose of complexity and a volume and a frequency. If you overwhelm them with any of those things, they're gonna be walking out of the gym saying, man, I don't know if I can do this, this is killing me. That's the absolute worst thing you can do. You've gotta ease them into it, you've gotta give them just a little bit, you know, it's that 25 pound deadlift on the bar. It's a few sets of body weight squats, a couple of sets of, you know, 25 pound bench presses or whatever the lightest they can handle for sets of five. You know, you're, you're in and out in 25 or 30 minutes and they've got a complete workout. And then you come in the next day and you add a couple pounds. You know, you go up five pounds on the deadlift, you go up two or three pounds on the bench. You have them do, you know, some more body weight squats, if, uh, an inch lower down and they go, wow, you know, I did it again and I feel okay. And I made a little bit of progress and that may be the first time they've ever made any progress, you know, on, on a fitness plan. 
Um, and so they're leaving there saying, man, I, I, I can do this and I, and I feel good. And they're not overwhelmed by the, by the commitment of time or energy or effort. Uh, you know, they're not having to interrupt their schedule that much to come in twice a week for, you know, half hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour at, at, at the most. Um, and so if you cannot overwhelm them on that first day, if you cannot overwhelm them with the complexity or the stress and just get them in and get them to say they can do this, you're going to have given that person a really, really good gift because it can completely change the trajectory of how they're going to age. Okay. And so again, it's really important you get that right off the, uh, right off the bat. So, um, what I want you guys to do is go in the comment section of this. And if you have any specific questions about a person, um, because that's the other thing with, with working with, with, with older people is they're, they're all very unique and they've all got their own kind of situation they're having to deal with. So I'm going to really try to stay active in the comment section for this video um, because I know a lot of you guys are going to have questions about mom, dad, grandma, or whatever. So put your questions in there. Try to keep it brief, and I'll get on there with some maybe some tips that can help you uh, help them. So anyways, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for listening. This is a very important subject. It's very near and dear to my heart. And so uh, any way that I can help you guys, help somebody that you know uh, get under the barbell as they get older, um, I'm willing to help you out. So uh, let me know what you think, and I will talk to you later. Thanks for watching.